Hello, everyone. Uh, this is David Montgomery, data journalist with NPR News. Uh, welcome to this uh, special live stream to discuss uh, redistricting in Minnesota. Uh, just making sure that everyone can hear me. Uh, looks good, getting good uh, good feedback there. Uh, yeah, so uh, as you may or may not have noticed, uh, uh, Minnesota is in the middle of uh, uh, congressional and legislative redistricting. This happens every 10 years after each U.S. Census in order to uh, redraw the lines for uh, America's political maps to match the population changes over the past decade. Uh, and the uh, Minnesota Supreme Court just announced that tomorrow at noon, uh, the new maps are going to come out. Uh, redistricting is officially the responsibility of the legislature and the governor, uh, but Minnesota has divided government who uh, can rarely agree on anything, uh, and redistricting is no exception. Uh, so. Because the uh, a legislative plan hasn't uh, seemed likely for a very long time, the courts have been uh, hearing lawsuits uh, and a panel has been appointed to draw new maps, and they're going to roll out those new maps tomorrow at noon. Uh, we don't know what those maps are going to say, what, what boundaries there are, but by looking at the uh, various maps that have been proposed uh, by both legislators and by groups that are, are part of the lawsuit, uh, pushing various different uh, interests, we can get a sense of uh, what some of the possibilities are for what these maps that the judges roll out might look like. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I'll get my uh, screen sharing set up in a moment. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, you guys, uh, let's see. We've got a couple questions that have come in. Uh, let me check with my producers about the best way for uh, further questions to be submitted. Uh, and I'll take as many questions as we can here today uh, and uh, show you some of the work. Uh, so I'm going to kick up uh, my screen sharing now. Uh, we've got a couple questions in. If you can leave a comment with your questions, we have uh, producers who are uh, monitoring that and will get those to me, and then I will be able to relay those questions on to you. Uh, all right, uh, so let's get screen sharing on. All right, uh, without creating an infinite regress of the screen sharing here. Uh, yeah, so. In general, uh, there are seven different uh, redistricting proposals that are on the table right now. Three of them are from legislative groups, uh, Democrats and Republicans in the state legislature. Uh, and then four are from outside groups who are part of this lawsuit. Uh, two of them are representing uh, the interests of Minnesota Republicans and Democrats uh, in particular. Uh, one uh, is uh, from a group of election experts uh, who've been involved in redistricting for years. Uh, the, the Watson plan, they're championing a sort of least change approach that preserves the current map as much as possible. And then there's a, another plan called the Cory plan. Uh, it's a, co a coalition that's trying to maximize uh, the interests of communities of color. Uh, so if we look over here uh, and see this, uh, this map here, this is Minnesota's current uh, congressional map. Uh, we've got eight districts. Uh, in general, there's uh, uh, the one district is centered on the northeastern part of the state. That's the 8th district. One is a southern district, District 1. We've got a western district, District 7. And to zoom in on the metro, uh, there's uh, District 5 is centered in Minneapolis, District 4 on St. Paul. District 3 is the western suburbs. District 2 is the southern suburbs. And District 6 is sort of the exurbs currently to the north and west. So I'll just roll out a... Uh, let's just sort of see how some of this stuff can change. Uh, let me turn off the highways here just to make this a little easier to follow. So this is the current map. Uh, and here is a uh, version uh, from the House Democrats uh, where you can see uh, uh, some, big some pretty big changes. So with the uh, current map, uh, the 8th District sort of runs through the northeastern part of the state. In this proposed map, the 8th district would run all across the northern part of the state, and the 7th district would shift down to the uh, southwest, and so on. That just gives you an example of some of these changes that can be made. Uh, the 
uh, results can end up having uh, pretty big impacts, uh, depending uh, not only changing who your representatives are, but also changing the political dynamic in Minnesota. Uh, now, you've probably heard in some other states this uh, people talk about so-called gerrymandering. Uh, that's when someone draws a political map to try to gain a political result by packing members of one party into one district or splitting them up over lots of different districts. Uh, and when, when done, that can take a state that leans only narrowly to one side and create districts that overwhelmingly elect members of one party or the other. Uh, Minnesota, because we don't have legislative redistricting, we've got redistricting drawn by a panel of judges, uh, we're not likely to see a heavily gerrymandered map. Uh, the results are probably going to be roughly proportionate to Minnesota's current uh, political setup. Uh, well, that's not to say perfectly proportionate. Uh, anytime you, you split up a state into uh, districts, you're going to have some amount of inefficiency, uh, which can benefit or harm one uh, party or the other. Uh, all right, so we've got a couple of questions coming in. Uh, so uh, Wendell asks, uh, just normal voters have no say in this whatsoever, right? Uh, how do citizens influence decisions like this? So the ordinary way that ordinary people will get involved in redistricting is uh, you would come testify to the legislature or contact your legislators as legislators were working on redistricting plans. But because the legislature has failed to uh, agree or even really to, to pass anything, there have been some proposals made, but uh, things never even got to the point of conference committees or the usual legislative process. Uh, that normal route was uh, sort of short-circuited. You, you had this uh, uh, redistricting uh, court case that's been going on, uh, and several groups have, have intervened. And other outside groups have filed uh, petitions in the court to say, you know, hey, judges, you should focus on this, you should not focus on this, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, that's about as, uh, as involved as people have been able to get. Uh, because this has been taken out of the normal political arena and into the judicial arena, there's not a huge role unless you're someone who uh, knows how to file an affidavit in a court case or has a friend who knows how to do that. Uh, we've got a really technical question here. Uh, James asks, uh, with the growth of Moorhead, will the city of Moorhead still be in one legislative district, uh, it's 4A, or could a portion of Moorhead be moved to legislative district 4B? Uh, so let's bring up the maps here. Uh, and I'm going to zoom in here uh, on Moorhead. All right, uh, so uh, let's look at the, the current legislative district here. Uh, I'm gonna make this a little lighter, to, it's easier to see. Uh, so right now, uh, legislative district 4A encompasses all of Moorhead, as uh, uh, James pointed out. So let's look at what uh, some of these other plans would do. Uh, oops. If you look at uh, the first legislative plan from the House of Democrats, uh, that keeps most of Moorhead in 4A, but it does put, uh, group this little uh, chunk off here into uh, 4B. Uh, looking at these other plans, the plan from the, uh, the second plan from, oops, there we go, the uh, uh, House Republicans splits Moorhead in two. Uh, much of Moorhead would be in the 5th and District 5A. Uh, and uh, uh, much of the rest of it, along with Dilworth, would be in 5B. The uh, Watson plan, this one designed to uh, correspond relatively closely with the current map. Uh, again, that keeps, uh, this splits Moorhead a little bit. Most of Moorhead would be in the same district, in this case 3A, uh, would be renamed a little bit. Uh, but that little northern chunk up there, uh, under the Watson plan, that would uh, be in District 3B. Just run through this really quickly. I know uh, probably most people don't have intense interest about the future redistricting of Moorhead. So we'll uh, try to uh, keep this brief for you. Uh, the uh, what? The, sorry. 
uh, Sox, Sox plan uh, also splits off this uh, sort of eastern section of Moorhead. And I forgot to say I'm not uh, uh, deeply up on the, the geography of Moorhead, so I can't explain uh, what's going on here. But it does sort of split off that one section that is not, for example, oh, nope. nope. There we go. Yes. That in the current plan is uh, part of the same district. The Cory Plan, uh, in the Cory Plan, the Moorhead District is 7A, uh, and it's most of Moorhead, although there's a little southwestern uh, chunk that's split off. The Anderson Plan, uh, this is another Republican plan, uh, like the first Republican plan, Tor uh, Torkelson, uh, that sort of splits Moorhead in two, uh, uh, into a, in a northern chunk and a southern chunk. And finally, the Johnson Plan, also another Republican plan, uh, also splits Moorhead in two. Uh, so, well, why might this happen? Uh, uh, you might notice that the the Democrat the Democratic plan largely kept Moorhead intact. The Republican plan lar plans uh, largely split it, uh, and that's because Moorhead is an uh, in, in that in this area has a relatively large number of Democrats. Uh, generally speaking, Democrats are stronger in cities and towns. Republicans in more rural areas. Uh, so, by keeping Moorhead all together, that maximizes the chance that that area, that district will be able to elect a Democrat. By splitting it in two and mixing parts of Moorhead with parts of more conservative rural areas, that increases the chances of electing Republicans. So that's sort of the, the, the calculus that goes on here. Uh, as you noted, Moorhead has grown. Uh, so even the uh, plans that are uh, uh, least change here, like the, the Watson plan, does end up splitting Moorhead a little bit. Uh, this map is just, this district is just pretty much Moorhead, uh, but there's an, enough people in there that it can't all fit in one district in the same way that it can right now, uh, where it includes all of Moorhead plus a stretch of the outlying area. All right. Uh, let's see. So uh, Nancy asks, uh, is redistricting segregation by another name? What do you know about racial dynamics as it relates to redistricting? Uh, so this is, again is a, a controversial uh, and, and big question uh, because one of the, the things that everybody knows that's is in all the data uh, uh, when uh, you, uh, people have when they use to draw new maps is the racial makeup of uh, all those little chunks of territory. And the reason we know that is because the Supreme Court uh, and the, the Voting Rights Act have, have all ruled that you can't do racial gerrymanders. You can't draw maps to try to uh, harm the interests of uh, uh, ra recognized racial minorities. Uh, now, in practice, there's a lot of leeway and a lot of uncertainty about how that gets interpreted. Uh, historically, there have been some cases where you know maps have been drawn to try to split up uh, minority populations uh, to uh, prevent them uh, from being able to elect uh, a representative uh uh, who is black or Native American or, or uh, whatever the, the case may be. Uh, a lot of the more recently, the, the fights have been a little bit more subtle. Uh, there's a, a lot more data out there now about the actual political leanings of uh, particular districts. And so people who are trying to draw a party map, a, a map to benefit one party or the other, used to have to rely on you know, racial and ethnic groups as sort of a crude proxy. Uh, you know, lots of uh, uh, African Americans might uh, suggest a, a an area that was heavily Democratic. In, you know, in Florida, lots of Cubans might uh, lean toward uh, the Republicans, and, and, and so on. Uh, but now that's not necessary to the same degree that it was. Uh, uh, again, Minnesota has judges drawing the maps, not politicians. So we're not seeing those. Uh, 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 rather cruder uh, gerrymanders uh, that uh, that can uh, target uh, ethnic groups in one way. Uh, one of the plans that was proposed, the Cory Plan, uh, they were they were explicitly trying to maximize the interests of communities of color, and the judges did say that uh, had a couple of the principles that they'll be using included: districts can't be drawn to infringe the voting rights of racial or ethnic minority groups, or to divide Native American reservations more than necessary. Uh, and so-called communities of interest uh, should be kept together where possible. And that's a very broad group. Uh, it includes uh, ethnic uh, ethnic groups, but also social, geographic, cultural, economic, occupational, etc. 
uh, uh, one of the stats that a lot of the uh, plans that were submitted to the court uh, uh, considered was uh, you know the number of minority opportunity districts. Uh, those are districts where a, a racial or ethnic minority has a su sufficient number of people uh, that there's a good chance that they would be able to elect a member of their group to represent them. So that's the sort of thing that was tracked. Uh, but in the idea of trying to promote representation uh, to some degree of those groups, uh, rather than uh, trying to uh, harm them, as in some of the, the segregationist gerrymanders that we've seen in the past. Uh, I've got a question from uh, that guy on Twitter uh, who asks, uh, what kind of changes are you seeing proposed for the 4th Congressional District? Uh, glad you asked. Bring this... Uh, <coughs> sorry about that. This chart up. Uh, the title's a little wonky. I uh, never got around to fixing that, but uh, I think we can move past that. Uh, here we've got uh, the six uh, different congressional plans. Uh, and you can see the, the the black shape is identical in each one. That's the current boundaries. Uh, and so the, two of these plans, the Watson and the Anderson plan, uh, don't make many changes at all to the 4th District, which is the one that's centered on St. Paul and the uh, eastern suburbs. Uh, you know, this area has grown relative to the rest of the state. Uh, so these all these boundaries have to shrink a little bit. So the, the Watson and Anderson plans both sort of cut off a little bit of the southeastern suburbs uh, to shrink and get the 4th District down to its ideal size. The other four plans that we have uh, all take somewhat more drastic uh, changes. The uh, So the Cory plan uh, cuts off a little bit uh, in that... Uh, uh, in the very uh, northwestern chunk and uh, fairly densely populated urban areas, and then add some sub suburbs to the south here. The Sox plan cuts out some of the southern suburbs and extends it uh, north. And we can uh, take a look at uh, what this means on the uh, full map here. So here's the... Uh, uh, fourth district right now. And if we toggle on the uh, Sox plan, we can see that uh, it's adding all these northern territories, which are places like uh, Hugo, uh, Lino Lakes, Forest Lake, uh, Scandia. Uh, those are places that are currently in the sixth congressional district, and the, the so uh, Sox plan would add them into the fourth. The Murphy plan uh, would uh, subtract some of these uh, southeastern uh, areas and would add in areas to the northwest. Uh, Blaine, Line of Lakes, would go into the 4th District in the Murphy plan. Uh, the Torkelson plan uh, sort of adds a little bit of these dense urban areas to the uh, northwest and then subtracts some of the suburbs to the northeast and southeast. Uh, all right. Uh, another question asked the same line uh, changes their proposed for the first district. Uh, here we've got sort of a, a big split. There's, there's sort of a philosophical question. Uh, right now, the first district runs across the entire southern border of Minnesota. Uh, as long as well as some areas up to the north, uh, taking in Mankato and Rochester. Uh, and there's a difference in these plans between the ones that preserve the first district running across the entire south of the state. Uh, the Watson plan does that, the Anderson plan, the Torkelson plan. Uh, and there are other plans that change the first district from being the entire south to being a southeastern district centered around Rochester uh, and stretching up a little bit further north to the Twin Cities. Again, we don't know what the judges are going to do. But th those are sort of the two big options. You can either keep the first district running along the uh, entire south of the state, or you can uh, cut off those western parts of the first district, give them to the seventh, and uh, then add more areas stretching up closer toward the Twin Cities uh, to create an air uh, a southeastern district centered around Rochester. Uh, all these plans, I should note, uh, the one whether. The ones like the uh, Murphy plan that uh, create a southeastern district center in Rochester, or the ones like the Torkelson plan that create a uh, that 
preserve the first district running across the whole south of the state. Both of them uh, would create a district with more Republican votes than Democratic votes, at least going by the 2020 election. Uh, but some of them would be closer than others. The first is one of the, the closest districts in the state. Uh, you know, the, the Murphy plan is a Democratic plan. That would create a district that only voted for Donald Trump by a couple of percentage points. The Torkelson plan, that's a Republican plan. That would create a first district that's much more safely Republican. Uh, uh, so there's some differences here. When you've got a district that's as close as the first is, uh, you know, you can make it closer or less close. Uh, anonymous, does the court make their plans based on these proposed partisan plans? Uh, so the court is officially taking note of uh, four plans, the Watson, Sox, Corey, and uh, Anderson plans, uh, which were uh, the ones submitted to the uh, court. So they're not looking at the ones from the legislature, the Murphy and Torkelson proposals. Uh, that said, uh, the Sox plaintiffs uh, were, represent were, all, were Democrats, were representing uh, the interests of the Democratic Party. And the Anderson plaintiffs are representing the interests of the Republican Party. So the uh, the these parties are having an, a role uh, by being parties to the lawsuit via uh, activists who've, who've taken place. Uh, so they will be considering those interests, but they're not going to be specifically considering the Murphy and Torkelson plans, uh, uh, though, or the Johnson plan, uh, which uh, is identical in, in congressional districts and different legislative. Uh, so that the will not all these will be taken into account by looking at them, we can get a better sense of what the possibilities might be. All right, waiting for other questions to come in. Uh, comment with your questions, our producers will notice them and uh, flag them for me. Uh, Let's see here. Uh, Ryan on Facebook asked, does the court look at the existing map? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Uh, the question is, how closely are they going to stick to the existing map? Uh, some people, like the Watson plaintiffs, uh, have argued that the court should use the existing map as its basis and then just adjust the existing map where necessary to equalize population, etc. Uh, some of these other plans have argued that the other interests that are involved here, uh, so, you know, whether promoting uh, minority communities uh, or, uh, you know, keeping uh, communities of interest together, things like that, have argued that those argue for more radical changes, uh, not being bound to the existing maps. Uh, uh, the argument is that you know, these first maps aren't perfect. They have their flaws. Uh, and we shouldn't be bound by them just because it's the status quo. The counter argument is, we have the status quo. It's a pretty good one. It's a reasonably competitive and uh, map that reflects Minnesota's uh, political uh, breakdown, and that uh, the best way to uh, preserve that is to stick with them. So there's that, that debate going on, and we don't know which way the judges will go. Uh, we could see maps that are very similar to the current maps, uh, or we could see more dramatic changes, such as some of these changes to the 8th, 7th, and 1st districts, uh, whether the 8th stretches across the, all of northern Minnesota, or is confined merely to the uh, northeast, whether the first is all across southern Minnesota, or is combined to the southeast, and so on. Uh, all right. Uh, it is almost 11 o'clock, so if you've got any questions, get them in now. Uh, we're going to have to end this soon, uh, so I can go switch from political data to COVID data, uh, and provide some updates uh, on my uh, Twitter account, at DHMontgomery, there. Uh, so get your questions in now before, so we can wrap up. Uh, if you don't have questions, they uh, can't get them in right now. Uh, still submit them later in the day. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll answer them uh, over the course of the day as they come in uh, in the comments. Uh, we'll also be back to uh, take your more questions about the new maps once they come out at noon tomorrow. Uh, sometime later this week, we'll probably do another live stream like this, uh, breaking down the changes. All right, we got a, a question that's prefaced that uh, this one is a bit complicated. Uh, uh, so they ask, uh, basically, uh, how with 
uh, cutting through the some of this, uh, in, a hyper, in this hyper-partisan moment, how can you ensure that no party is over or underrepresented according to overall state political leaning? Uh, can you speak to how the various maps accomplish this goal? Uh, so the judges, some of the plaintiffs have uh, explicitly argued that the court should look at uh, partisan votes to try to create maps that are representative of uh, America, of Minnesotans' political leanings. Uh, that is to say that, you know, uh, uh, Minnesota is a state that's uh, closely divided, leans a little bit toward the Democrats in the recent elections, uh, at least in statewide elections, uh, that, the, that, you know, uh, uh, and if you, if you have a state that leans a little to the Democrats and you draw maps that consistently return a majority of Republicans, they would argue that that's a problem. Uh, the court did not adopt that proposal as one of their guidelines. Uh, they've adopted a... Uh, a guideline that districts should not be drawn with the intention to promote or harm any party or to promote or harm the interests of particular politicians. Uh, but they have not adopted a, a principle of proportionality. So they, at least officially, are not going to be considering uh, politics as a factor. That said, we have this data. Uh, I can consider politics a factor. You can consider politics as a factor. Uh, here you can see in the on the left uh, on this graph that I've... Uh, uh, broken down how each district would lean politically uh, on the legislative level. Uh, you can see uh, that if uh, Minnesotans vote the way they did in 2020, uh, you would uh, most likely see a Democratic uh, uh, Minnesota House in the legislature. Uh, because a, a, the majority of the seats were won by Joe Biden, uh, or rather Joe Biden got more votes than Donald Trump in 2020, and a majority of seats under all these different maps, from the ones drawn by Democrats, the ones drawn by Republicans, the ones drawn by nonpartisan groups. Uh, and in order to win a majority, uh, Republicans would have to eat deep into places where Joe Biden won. But uh, if the map the political environment is a little bit more favorable to Republicans than 2020, where Joe Biden won about 53% of the vote in Minnesota, or at least the two-party vote, uh, then the picture changes. So if you if you weight this based on the 2016 vote, uh, when Hillary Clinton won by just a bare minimum margin over Donald Trump in Minnesota, uh, suddenly all these maps are either toss-ups or lean toward the Republicans. Uh and you might say, well, why, why if, if Hillary Clinton narrowly won, do these maps lean toward the Republicans? Well, some of them are drawn by Republicans and sort of intended to produce that result. Uh, but it's also the case that uh, in Minnesota, as well as most other parts of the country, Democrats uh, sort of naturally, because Democrats represent urban areas, uh, areas that are represented by Democrats tend to be more heavily concentrated. Uh the, the, the Democratic strongholds tend to be 80 or 90 percent Democratic. Republican strongholds are often like 70 percent Republican, which means that Republican votes are more efficiently distributed uh, when it comes to trying to win a majority of districts. Uh, and this you can quantify this with a measure called the efficiency gap. Uh, and it turns out in almost all these plans, from the existing map to even some of the plans drawn by Democrats, would have any, a so-called efficiency gap that uh, favors the Republicans. Uh, the, there's one exception is the, the map drawn by the House Democrats for the uh, House, which, not surprisingly, they managed to find a way to create an, uh, a map that's more efficient for the Democrats. Uh, but pretty much all these uh, other maps, uh, even with the 2020 electoral results, uh, Republicans are a couple percentage points more efficient. Now, this, this isn't a, an aggressive gerrymander. People have often used 7 or 8 percent. Uh, efficiency gaps is a sign of a gerrymander. None of these these maps uh, are, are that extreme. Uh, certainly, even despite these efficiency gaps, Democrats absolutely could uh, and have uh, win a majority of, of both chambers here. Uh, but Republicans have this very slight advantage just based on how people are distributed. And it's hard to get around that with single member districts like we have. The question asked, asked about uh, this idea of uh, multi-member districts is a, another proposal that's been tossed about to try to deal with this, where each district elects multiple members. Uh, parliamentary systems have uh, what's called proportional representation, uh, often where 
you look at the statewide vote and you uh, apportion out the seats based on the share of the statewide vote. There are lots and lots of different models out there in political science of ways to draw maps to try to uh, accomplish various goals of proportionality and, and such. Uh, with the single member districts with first past the post elections, uh, there's only so much you can do. Uh, and right now in our current political environment, that gives a very minor edge to Republicans, even with a fair, fairly drawn single member district map. All right, well, uh, I've got to wrap things up and uh, head over to COVID. So thank you everyone for joining. Uh, keep your questions coming in. We will answer them. Uh, we will also be back, uh, as I said, uh, later this week uh, after the maps are released at noon tomorrow uh, to do another uh, video Q&A. Uh, and also, of course, stay tuned to NPR News and uh, NPRnews.org to uh, read articles and uh, hear uh, a newscast discussing the uh, maps as they come out tomorrow, looking at uh, the impact that they are. If you go to NPRnews.org right now, uh, we've got an article uh, that I wrote last week uh, that includes a tool where you can type in your own address and see how each of the different plans would redistrict you. Uh, so uh, stay tuned. Uh, keep your questions coming.